Heights. Good morning, Highland Congregational Church. How are we doing today? That was pretty good. All right. Before we dive into our message this morning, let's now go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and we boldly declare and we boldly recognize that you are, in fact, the one true God. And we just stand in awe of you, of your love, your grace, your mercy for us, all of the different ways in which you have blessed us in our lives, in the good times and in the bad times, on those mountaintop experiences, and then also even in the midst of those valleys. Generally, Father, I just pray now that as we once again take a look at your word, in particular the third beatitude, that you would open up our eyes, our ears, our hearts to receive your glorious truth, concerning your son Jesus Christ and how he was indeed the meekest individual who has ever walked the face of this planet and how you were able to work extremely powerfully, infinitely powerful through his work and through specifically his death and resurrection. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, we just thank you for this good news. We thank you for this opportunity to open up your word, to take a look at this passage. I ask that you would be with me now as I deliver to your people your word. And I just come before you and I just pray this prayer in your son's powerful name, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, HCC, I encourage you right now to open up your Bibles, if you've not done so yet already, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, we are going to be in the third beatitude this morning, and that is found in the fifth verse. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. A couple of months ago, perhaps even a few months ago now, uh, ESPN, they released a documentary uh, in the midst of the shutdown, uh, some a type of a sports documentary to appease all of the sport fans out there who were going without sports. And that particular documentary was referred to and is called The Last Dance. And this particular documentary, this 10-part uh, film or episodes, uh, they go through and they talk about and they highlight the 1990 Chicago Bulls. Do I hear any boos out there? That's right. All right. I want to make sure we're all, we all know where we stand with that. Uh, in particular, when it goes through that 10-part series, it zeroes in on one particular player, and that player is M Michael Jordan. Yeah, there we go. There's another boo. Um, in my opinion, even though I am a devoted Detroit Pistons fan, I grew up probably the Detroit Bad Boys, what got me into sports. Um, I do have to humbly admit that Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player of all time. I know. Don't throw anything at me. Uh, going through this 10-part series, you see Michael Jordan and what truly made him great. And one of the things that is just continually brought to the surface and is talked about by people that knew him most intimately, some of his fellow teammates, is that Michael Jordan, he was an extremely aggressive individual. He knew exactly what he wanted, and he was going to go after that particular goal those championships, no matter what the cost. And so on several parts throughout this documentary, you see Michael Jordan very confidently assert himself and go after individuals. This individual here, Michael Jordan, he is a very, very confident, uh, some people would even say arrogant individual. But that is what, in part, made him great, is that he had that determination, he had that aggressiveness about him. 
to attain those six championships and all of those accolades that went along with it. When we take a look at the scriptures, when we look at God's economy, we see that greatness in God's eyes is actually, is actually the complete opposite. It is not arrogance. It is not pride. It is not asserting oneself. It is not pushing people over in order to attain what you are after. Greatness in God's eyes comes down to a sense of meekness and humility. And so today what we are going to be doing in this third beatitude is we are going to see Jesus Christ, in fact, endorse that particular characteristic or that quality. And we're going to see Jesus Christ with this beatitude say, yes, definitely those individuals who are aggressive, who are pushy, who do view themselves as number one, they try to attain happiness in life by going about life in that particular way. But that is not how true happiness is attained. True happiness is attained when one humbles himself before the Lord. When one treats other people more significant than themselves. And when one ultimately places him or herself under God's complete control. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 6, or Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, we see Jesus Christ preach one of the greatest sermons ever preached. This sermon is come to be known as the Sermon on the Mount. And in these chapters here, we see Jesus teach his Jewish audience about the true interpretation of the Old Testament and then how God's people, even more specifically, his disciples were to live their lives in accordance to those divine commandments. And so at the outset of this historic sermon, in this sermon's introduction, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 11, we see Jesus reveal the Sermon on the Mount's main objective. And that is this. How God's people, how Jesus' disciples, that is Christians, were to personally experience God's divine blessing in their lives. And so in this sermon's introduction, you see Jesus Christ go through and identify eight qualities or eight characteristics that he encourages his disciples to cultivate in order to experience that true, that everlasting happiness that each and every single one of God's image bearers is after. And so we began this sermon series a few weeks ago. A couple of weeks ago, Brett preached on the first beatitude in verse number three. Blessed are the poor in spirit. With this characteristic, we saw that a person can begin, can only begin to experience divine blessing, true, everlasting happiness when they actually come to the end of themselves. When they realize that they are totally depraved, that spiritually speaking, they are absolutely hopeless and helpless. Only then can an individual be blessed with God's overwhelming salvation and begin to experience that true joy and everlasting happiness. Last week, we took a look at the second beatitude. Verse number four, blessed are those who mourn. With this paradoxical beatitude, with this paradoxical characteristic, we saw that God's people, that Christians, experience divine happiness when they do indeed mourn. When they weep, when they express sorrow and grief over sin. And as they mourn over sin in their lives and over the sin, the outworking of sin in the world, we see that godly mourners will truly be comforted by God's salvation from sin, by God's Spirit, His Holy Spirit aiding them 
to confront sin in their lives. And then also they'll be comforted by God's eternal promises. That one day, indeed, God will carry out justice on all creation. And so today, as we continue on in our sermon series, we are going to take a look and we are going to look at the third beatitude, which is found in verse number five. Follow me there, if you will. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So first of all, with this beatitude, we're going to talk about what does it mean to be truly meek? What does that word entail? Who are the meek? amongst us. And then secondly, we are going to also consider what did Jesus mean when he said, when he promised, when he guaranteed that the meek shall inherit the earth. What is Jesus talking about there? Are you guys ready? We're going to dive into this beatitude right now. So the very beginning of this beatitude in Matthew chapter 5 verse 5, Jesus began by announcing, blessed are the meek. Now, we need to recognize that the meek that Jesus is referring to here in this verse is not the meek that people often think of. Oftentimes in our society, when somebody is identified or when somebody is referred to as being meek, they're thought of as being a wimp, right? They're thought of as being physically weak, and they're also thought of being personally passive. HGC, hear me out. This is not the person that Jesus had in mind with this particular beatitude. In this beatitude, Jesus used the Greek term praus to describe the meek individual. This word praus, it can be literally translated as meek. It can also be translated as a mildness of disposition and or a gentleness of spirit. So, according to the Bible, the scripture's definition of meekness describes the biblically meek individual as the person who is not passive. But instead, that individual expresses his or her emotions in a mild manner. Or that individual is even keeled. According to the scriptures, according to the Bible's definition of meekness, a biblically meek individual is a person who is not a wimp, who is not physically weak, but instead... A meek person, according to the scriptures, is a person who exercises what power they have, what influence they have, what authority they have been given with gentleness and tenderness. Another way in which you can, in which, one, in which we can understand biblical meekness is that the biblically meek individual is the person who is, are you ready? who is under control. Think of it from that perspective. A person who is under control. In other words, they're not out of control. The biblically meek individual is a person whose emotions are under control. The person whose emotions are out of control, that person's just hangry or angry. The biblically meek individual is the person whose power and authority and influence is under control. The individual whose power is out of control, the individual whose authority is out of control, that individual is a dictator or a tyrant. Or that person can be described described as being aggressive or pushy. You guys following me so far? The biblically meek individual is also the person whose ego is under control. The person whose ego is out of control, that individual is arrogant 
That individual is prideful. That individual can be referred to as Michael Jordan. I mean, (laughs) sorry. That individual can be referred to as a selfish jerk, right? The bottom line, when it comes to understanding biblical meekness, the biblically meek individual is the person who is not just under control. Let me even be even more specific here. But he is under God's control. The biblically meek individual is the person who is under God's control. And if we were to turn in our Bibles towards the end of Matthew's Gospel, in Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11, we would see described in that passage there Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. At, during the times of the New Testament, the Jewish people, they expected the Messiah's arrival to be powerful. They expected his entrance into Jerusalem to be a glorious and a powerful event. However, when we look at that passage there in Matthew chapter 21, we see that that is not how Jesus arrived. We see that is not how Jesus entered into Jerusalem. In this passage, we see that Jesus, he actually entered into Jerusalem under God's control, according to God's word. And we see described in Matthew chapter 1, Jesus entering into Jerusalem, riding on the back of a donkey. Verses 4 and 5 of Matthew chapter 21 says that, Jesus' entrance is actually fitting because it's in accordance to the Old Testament prophecy, which says this, This took place to fulfill what was spoken of by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you. Humble. That word humble there in Matthew chapter 1, it's the same word that we have in Matthew chapter 5. That Greek term, praus. Jesus, your king is coming to you humble, mounted on a colt, the fowl of a beast of burden. HCC, God blesses the meek. Are you a biblically meek individual? Every single one of us here, if you have placed your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ, if you are truly one of his disciples, if you are a Christian, you are called. If there's not anyone that is exempt from this particular beatitude, all of us here have been called to cultivate this characteristic, this beatitude in our lives. And the primary way in which we can become biblically meek is by placing ourselves under God's control. Are you biblically meek? Are you under God's control? Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to James. James chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. James chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. James chapter 1, verses 19 through 21 speaks of how we as Christians can cultivate this beatitude, meekness in our lives. So James chapter 1, beginning in verse 19, says this. Know this, my beloved brothers. Listen up. This is interesting. I find this pretty cool. Let every person... Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Talk about being under control, right? Right there, he, James is basically instructing his readers. You need to make sure your emotions are under control, and you need to make sure your tongue is under control. And he goes on, he says, For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, Put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. And, here we go, 
receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. When James here in this passage, when he says, receive with meekness the implanted word, what is the implanted word? Oh, come on, HCC, you you gotta help me out here. What is the implanted word? It's God's word. Thank you, it's the scriptures. It's the Bible. HCC, as we place ourselves under God's, or that's how we place ourselves under God's control. By simply reading the scriptures and then living our lives according to what the scriptures command and how they instruct us to live our lives. When we hear the scriptures, when we read the scriptures, and then when we obey the scriptures, when we do what the scriptures command us to do, meekness will begin to be cultivated in our lives because ultimately we are placing ourselves under God's control. As we seek to cultivate meekness in our lives by applying the Bible, we discover then that all different aspects of our lives come under God's control. Our tongues come under God's control. Our emotions come under God's control. Our finances come under a God's control. Our personality comes under God's control. Our authority, our influence comes under God's control. Our selfish egos come under God's control. And as we come under God's control, HCC, let it be known that it's then when we can experience divine blessing in our lives. It's then when we place on our knee, when we place our lives under God's control, it is only then when we can finally experience what our hearts are longing after. And that is real and true and everlasting happiness. HTC, when we place ourselves under God's control, not only will we begin to sense meekness begin to be cultivated in our lives, not only will we be blessed by him, or I should say, not only will we find ourselves being blessed by God, but we'll find ourselves being blessed by God too in other ways. When we continue on and back in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, when we go to the second half of that beatitude, we see Jesus concluding the third beatitude with a promise concerning the future of the biblically meek. And there in this particular beatitude, we see Jesus promise the biblically meek that they will inherit the earth. Now, this guarantee would have definitely caught the attention of Jesus' Jewish audience. Excuse me, God's people at that time, the Jewish people, they were incredibly proud people. In particular, they were proud of their patriarch Abraham and God's promise to Abraham, as well as Abraham's descendants of the promised land. If we were to go back and reflect upon what we talked about on Sunday mornings in the spring, we reflect back upon Genesis chapter 12, 13, 15, and 17, we would be reminded that in those passages, God explicitly promising Abram and his offspring the land of Israel as an eternal possession. There was just one problem, though, in Jesus' day. In Jesus' day, at the time of the New Testament, the Jewish people did not have complete and total possession of the land that God had promised to them. At the time of the New Testament, the land had been taken over and it had been controlled and it had been governed by the Romans and Caesar. This unfortunate reality, the Jewish people just absolutely despised. 
this reality actually heightens their anticipation of the Messiah. They believe that there was going to indeed, according to the Old Testament Scriptures, be a day when the Messiah was going to arrive in a very powerful way. They believed that the Messiah then, He would march into Jerusalem, that He would decisively exert His authority, overthrow the Romans, retake the land for their own possession, and then reestablish the Jewish people to their God-given position of prominence in the world. So Jesus' dis- so, so Jewish audience would have been caught off guard here with this particular beatitude. Perhaps even a little stunned when he declared that it was not the mighty, that it was not the strong, but it was the meek. It was those individuals who were humble, those individuals who were under God's control, who were going to inherit not just the promised land, but the entire earth. This beatitude ran contrary to everything that they believed, everything they hoped for in their Messiah, even how they lived their lives in their minds, as well as in the minds of the rest of the world. It was the powerful, it was the aggressive who were going to get what they wanted, who were going to get what they desired, much like the mentality of many people today. And Jesus here, with this beatitude, he says, you guys have it all wrong. You guys have it completely backward. It is not the strong, and it is not the mighty who inherits the earth. It is the meek. It is those individuals who have placed themselves under God's control. These individuals, these people will be divinely blessed and richly rewarded. HGC, it is indeed the meek who will be blessed by God and inherit the earth. Let me say that to you again. Because much like Jesus' audience, this is a splash of cold water in our face as well. It is the biblically meek who are blessed by God and who will inherit the earth. These individuals experience true and everlasting joy and happiness. A couple of weeks ago, as many of you know, I was on vacation and I was in the outer banks of North Carolina. And while I was there, I saw many beach homes and I thought to myself, oh wow, that's really nice. How do I get myself one of those? I know what I need to do. I need to work hard. I need to save my money. I need to invest wisely. And one day, if I'm lucky enough, I might be able to take possession of some waterfront property on the coast of Carolina. How many of you, does does that sound good to any of you? Sounds good to me. All right. While that may be true, if I work hard and apply myself, a man can dream, right? The Bible, though, says this. The Bible says that one day, God is going to simply give and bless the biblically meek, those who place themselves under his control with a very real, with a very physical gift that is infinitely greater than anything we can attain here on earth. The gift that God is going to bless the meek with in the future, it is going to blow any beach house out of the water. In Romans chapter 8, in fact, I'm going to have you turn there. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17 contains a truth that I believe we as Christians, we need to realize, we need to come to grab a hold of and place towards the center of our lives. 
Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17 says this. The Spirit Himself, that's the Holy Spirit, bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. If you've placed your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ, if you've submitted yourself to God's authority, even more specifically, Jesus' Lordship, if He's the Lord of your life, let it be known to you that you are a child of God. And then Paul continues on in this passage, and he says, And if children, then heirs. Heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. We are fellow heirs with Christ. Christ has been promised some glorious realities. And those blessings which have been promised to him have been promised to God's children as well. The biblically meek, those individuals who recognize their spiritual poverty, the biblically meek, those individuals who mourn over their sinfulness and then are comforted by God's salvation, the biblically meek, those individuals who place themselves under God's control, are children of God. And as children of God, as adopted sons and daughters, God has promised the meek the same inheritance as his son Jesus Christ, right? That's what the scripture says. Do you believe it? This raises the question, well, what has God promised Jesus specifically? What is Jesus's divine inheritance because whatever jesus is said to receive is going to be ours as well in hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 it speaks of jesus's inheritance that is promised to him by god it says this long ago and at many times and in many ways <coughs> god has spoken to our fathers by the prophet but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Who's his son? It's Jesus, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. God the Father has promised Jesus the world. And as co-heirs with Christ, God has promised the biblically meek the same thing. HCC, one day, if you are a Christian, if you are truly a child of God, let it be known to you that God will give you the meek, the new heavens and the new earth for your possession. The new heavens and the new earth are ours. So, will you inherit the earth? Will you inherit the earth? Are you a biblically meek individual? Have you placed yourself under God's authority in your life? When all time, when all history comes to an end, and a survey is done of all of those individuals who have walked humbly with God in meekness under his authority, one person will stand out from the rest of them all. And that is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the meekest individual who has ever walked the face of this planet, bar none. Jesus had every right to come to earth, display his greatness, exert his authority, and have everybody, rightfully so, bow down and worship him, right? Is that what Jesus did? No, it's not. When Jesus Christ, he came to earth, even his arrival was under God's control. And as we study the New Testament, in particular the Gospels, <coughs> Excuse me. We see Jesus Christ living a life 
of complete and perfect submission to God the Father's authority. We see Jesus Christ time after time after time displaying perfectly this beatitude of meekness. And as a result, what did God the Father do? God the Father blessed Jesus Christ immensely. And Jesus Christ, in submission to God the Father, he went to the cross and he died a sinner's death. Was Jesus a sinner? Oh, no. But he did so anyways in obedience to God the Father. Upon dying as a sacrifice for all of us, for all believers here, we see that, Jesus, we see that God the Father blessed Jesus Christ by powerfully raising him from the grave, proving and establishing his authority and Jesus' authority even over sin and death. And then what does the text say in Philippians chapter 2? And then the text says there that God the Father has given him the title Lord. And where we see Jesus Christ then reigning over all creation. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. And one day we will recognize every single one of us, some of us willingly, some of us unwillingly, will bend the knee and will worship Jesus Christ as Lord. HGC, are you biblically meek? And one day, will you inherit the earth? If you're biblically meek, let it be known to you that God has given you something incredible. That our future is just absolutely mind-blowing. And in the meantime, we can truly experience as we live underneath God's control, underneath His submission, what true joy and everlasting happiness is. Let us pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we come before you today, Lord. I want to thank you for this day that you have given us to gather here to worship your holy, your magnificent name. God, I just ask that you would begin or continue to cultivate this beatitude in our lives. That you would conform us further unto the image of your son, Jesus, who was the meekest individual who has ever walked the face of this planet. And I pray that as we become more and more meek in our lives, as we continue to place all of the aspects of our lives under your authority, that you would work very powerfully in our lives and through our lives and furthering your kingdom here on earth and continuing to build your church for your glory. Now, Heavenly Father, we just come before you in closing. We just thank you for all of the blessings that you have placed into our lives. We thank you ultimately, though, for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his life. We thank you for his death. We thank you for his resurrection. And we are looking forward to his return. And we just come before you now. And we just pray this prayer in your son's powerful name, Jesus Christ. Amen.